Welcome to the Immune Deficiency Foundation Young Adult Video Series. This video will cover switching between intravenous immunoglobulin and subcutaneous immunoglobulin, and vice versa. My name is Adam Freestone, and I'm the Director of Communications and Digital Media at the Immune Deficiency Foundation. First, I would like to introduce Margaret Mary Conger, Senior Patient Engagement Associate from CSL Bering, to say a few words. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to speak to you on behalf of CSL Bering today. CSL Bering is proud to sponsor the Young Adult Video and Webinar Series for the second year. We at CSL recognize the importance of patient education. I hope that you watch each of the videos in this series because the information is so valuable. The better informed you are, the more prepared you will be to make important decisions about your care. Thank you so much, Margaret Mary, and thank you to CSL Bering for sponsoring this great program. Our presenter for switching between ABIG and sub-Q and vice versa is William Bluen. William serves as a consultant and nurse practitioner within the Allergy and Immunology Care Center of South Florida and is chair of the IDF Nurse Advisory Committee. Please welcome William Bluen. Hi, um, my name is William Bluen. I'm a nurse practitioner in immunology and allergy, and I'm here today to talk to you about switching between IVIG and subcutaneous IG and vice versa. Um, I am a consultant for CSL Bearing, otherwise I don't have any ties to industry. Um, and what we'll talk about today uh, in general will be switching from IV to sub-Q immunoglobulin therapy and also the reverse, switching from sub-Q to IV immunoglobulin therapy. And we'll talk a little bit about the side effects of each one versus the more serious adverse effects of each one, and uh, hopefully uh, share a couple of tips and tricks and things to watch out for when you get involved in the whole process. Okay. Switching from IVIG to subcutaneous immunoglobulin, um, there are benefits um, from switching from one form to the other. Um, you may find if you're on uh, intravenous immunoglobulin that um, switching to sub-Q gives you a lot more flexibility in scheduling when you do your infusions. Um, it can give you a, a greater level of independence and control. You're not going to be dependent on when an infusion center is going to be open or when a nurse is going to be able to come to your house. Um, so you can kind of do things uh, at your own pace and in your own time frame. Um, IVIG also gives you a steadier um, immunoglobulin level. Um, and if you've been having trouble with um, you know, the immunoglobulin blues or getting um, infections at some point or another, you may have find some benefit from switching to the IG route, uh, to, to the sub-Q route, excuse me. Um, and in general, there's probably going to be fewer side effects of uh, subcutaneous immunoglobulin than there will be with intravenous. Um, yeah, along with the benefits certainly come challenges. Um, it really means that you're going to be more responsible for your infusions. Um, you're really going to need to be fairly organized to, to be able to get this done. You're going to have to have your supplies available and have a time and place, and you're going to have to remind yourself that you've got to do it. Um, and if you have fears about uh, sticking yourself with a needle um, or of being independent from, you know, the, the nice, tight, safe confines of the healthcare system, um, you're going to have to face those fears. Um, um, when you're switching from IV to sub-Q, um, you really need to know that it does take time to get the whole process started. First of all, you're going to have to talk to your healthcare provider. Um, about your reasons for wanting to switch um, and if it, they think it's going to be beneficial for you. 
And there's also going to have to be a discussion with your insurance company. Um, you're always going to have to say, mother, may I, along the line here to be able to get permission to do this. Because when you get approved for immunoglobulin therapy, you get approved for a particular drug and a particular route. And if you want to change that, there is a process that has to be gone through to be able to get that change authorized. Um, when you're talking to your provider, you're going to need to talk about the kind of supplies that you have. Um, which product you're going to use because there are several different kinds of subcutaneous products, what kind of pump it's going to go in by, what kind of rate tubing, um, because with the sub-Q, the tubing does control the speed of the infusion, and what kind of uh, needle length and type and how many needles you're going to need to use. So there's a lot of supply discussion, and again, all that's got to be set up with your insurance company and with the um, uh, specialty pharmacy that's going to be delivering the medicine and the supplies to you. Um, and with your, when you're talking with your provider, you really need to have a frank conversation about what your needs are. What kind of a lifestyle do you have? What's your, what's your schedule like? You know, do you need to do this because you're going to be going to college? When are you going to have time to do it? Um, you know, where are you going to be able to do it? So there, there's a lot of discussion that you really need to have about um, how it's going to fit into your life, because it's really got to fit into your life to be effective. And then there's also got to be planning um, to get the supplies delivered to you. So it's not going to be walk into the office uh, on IV one day and then walk out tomorrow and be starting sub-Q. It really will take a little bit of time to get the whole thing organized. Okay. Um, when you're switching from uh, IV to uh, subcutaneous, um, there is going to be a degree of training that's necessary. Um, you're going to have to be trained in it, and depending on your age and your ability, maybe somebody in your family or one of your friends might also need to be trained in how to do it in the event that you're not able to do it yourself. Um, I think when you're thinking about training, um, I, I like the, the, the see one, do one, show one approach. You know, the, when, on the see one phase, um, somebody who knows how to do it, hopefully a nurse from an experienced nursing care agency, will come in and show you how to do it. Um, and you watch and you ask questions. Um, and then when you're in the do one phase, then you do it yourself with um, them standing there by your side, guiding you and giving you some help along the line if you need it. Um, and then finally, in the show one phase, they stand by and they watch you do the whole thing, make sure that you haven't missed any critical steps and that you are able to do the whole infusion start to back all by your own, just with, with no guidance from them. So usually I think it's a good idea when you're switching from IV to, to sub-Q to, to plan for probably three sessions so that you can see one, do one, and show one. Um, when you're switching from IV to sub-Q, it's really important, as I say, to know thyself. Do you really want to switch? Um, if you don't want to switch, then don't. But if this is something that's going to be important for you, it's going to make your life go easier, or it's going to make you feel healthier, then um, you certainly should be considering switching. But you really need to know um, that this is what you want to do, because it is something that will require a lot of um, independence on your part. Um, uh, you need to be able to plan for how you want it to be scheduled. You know, where, where and when do you want to infuse? Do you want to do it while you're sitting at home watching TV? Do you want to do it while you are um, doing your homework? Um, I know of a patient who would go to the library at college and find a place in the stalls and do it there because it was, you know, out of the way of the chaos of the dorm. Um, but you need to know sort of where you want to do it. And you also need to know how often you want to infuse. With, with subcutaneous therapy, it can be done in a huge variety of ways. Um, it can be done once a week. It can be done once a day. It can be done every two weeks. 
um, and there is an augmented uh, form of therapy where it can be done approximately every three to four weeks. So you need to, again, plan for um, uh, how often you want to infuse. There's a lot of flexibility in it so that um, you, can, you can change it up a bit if you need to. Um, but you, you need to be able to plan for how much time you want to spend and how often you want to do it. Um, so again, it's important to know yourself. And then, you know, body image, I think, is important. Um, depending on um, how many different sites you infuse your subcutaneous medicine into, um, you're, when you infuse into the site, you're putting medicine under the skin and you're going to have a bump that's going to be there at the site, um, maybe some redness, and it goes away. Um, but if you are a young woman and you're going to be spending time in a bikini at the beach, um, or if you are a ripped and shredded young man and um, you want to be showing off your abs, uh, at the gym, you need to, again, think of um, how big a bump do you want to show, how do you want to schedule your life around it, and how many sites do you want to infuse into. The more sites you infuse into, obviously, the, the lesser amount is going to go into each site. But you need to consider the way that you want to look after your infusion. Um, okay. Um, and it, it certainly does take time to adapt um, when you are switching from one form of immunoglobulin to the other. So when you're, when you're planning, um, you, you, you want to be sure that you've got a follow-up appointment set up. Um, you, so that, you know, if you decide you're going to start on sub-Q, make sure that you've got an appointment set up for um, a month or two months with your primary um, provider or the prescriber who's pr pr providing your immunoglobulin so that if you have any issues that come up in infusion when you're on your own, that you've got a plan for how you're going to be able to address those things. Between the time that you start your infusion and the time that you go back for your follow-up, you certainly want to have a list of questions and concerns and keep it on a piece of paper or in your phone, um, but you want to be able to get your questions and concerns answered. Maybe you want to make a plan for um, getting telephone access to your provider in between when you start and when you have your follow-up appointment, um, but you certainly do need to uh, schedule uh, some follow-up, and you also need to know that it does take time to adapt to a new form of therapy. Um, when you're switching, um, there are some side effects that you can have, and, and these are sort of the minor effects. Um, you can get some local site reaction, and that's usually some redness and irritation and maybe some itching around the site where you've infused the, the medication. Um, and that can be controlled a little bit with, um, with the technique of infusion. Um, but that tends to be fairly minor. It, can, it, uh, it, it does uh, tend to go away. Um, and you can also have some leakage um, of fluid from the, from the site. Again, it all depends on your, your technique. Um, some things that you can do to prevent those sort of local side effects is um, one, you can apply, you can apply cold. Um, that will, um, you can certainly do that before an infusion, and that makes it less painful to, to start. And you can apply cold afterwards um, immediately if you like, and that can um, also help with, um, you know, to numb the area after you've had the infusion. Um, uh, there is a, a technique called dry priming that helps. Um, it's important to remember that um, sub-Q uh, gamma globulin is a skin irritant. And the trick with doing the infusion is to make sure that when you are getting the medicine in, that it's not getting into your skin, but it's getting into the subcutaneous tissue. You know, and you, it, on, your, on your body, you have your skin on the outside, and then your subcutaneous tissue is underneath that, and the layer of skin is really fairly, fairly thin, just a couple of millimeters. 
And the trick is um, to be able to get the needle into the subcutaneous tissue and not get any of the liquid medication into the skin on the way in or on the way out. Um, so one of the things that we can do to prevent that is what we call dry priming. And when I say dry priming, what I mean is you, um, when you're priming the tubing, you make sure that none of the uh, immunoglobulin preparation leaks out of the end. You stop it before it gets to the needle so that when you're sticking the needle in, the needle is going in dry. Um, and by the, um, uh, by the same token, when you're taking the needle out, um, you want to make sure that there's nothing dripping out into the skin when you're pulling it out. So there is a technique that I've mentioned here called air lock and clamp. Um, with, with that, what you can do is clamp the tubing to make sure that there's nothing going to be flowing in either direction um, when you're taking the needle out. Um, and sometimes if you're having trouble with irritation, um, what you can do is right at the end of your infusion, you can uh, clamp the tubing, disconnect it, put a little bubble of air and push it through the tubing so that all of the medicine has gone through the tubing, and then clamp it again and then pull it out. And that way there's, there's no medicine that's going to be leaking into the tissue. Um, the other thing that's important to help prevent local effects is we always say you're going to put the needle in where you can pinch an inch, um, but you want to make sure that the needle gets in deep into the subcutaneous tissue. So um, rather than have the skin pinched when you're putting the needle in, it's probably better, or the technique that I like is to actually spread and stretch the skin with your fingers and then put the needle in straight at a 90 degree angle and then tape it in place. And then that way you're going to make sure that you are getting the needle into the subcutaneous tissue. Um, site reactions um, can also be, you, you could have done all this stuff correctly um, and you're still having redness and irritation um, at the site. Um, Sometimes that can be related to a defect in the needle. You know, we've had circumstances come up where there have been some manufacturing defects on certain needles, and there have been burrs, microscopic burrs, on the end of the needle, and they actually irritated the skin um, when they were being inserted uh, and removed. So um, if you feel like you're doing everything right and you've had somebody, you know, it's always a good idea to have somebody else take a look at your technique if you're having a lot of site reactions. Um, and if everything is going okay and so far as your technique goes, it may be necessary to think about changing the brand of the needle. Um, so again, uh, in your insertion technique and your site selection is, is key. Um, you know, uh, most people tend to infuse subcutaneous um, into their abdomen because there's a lot, of, um, a lot of subcutaneous tissue there. Some people like to do it into their legs. Uh, some people who don't have a lot of subcutaneous tissue will use the area sort of at the top of their hips uh, even somebody who's very lean and got a six or an eight pack abs will usually have enough subcutaneous tissue at the um, at the top of their hips to be able to uh, get a good site. And again, um, it sort of depends on where you want your bump to be. Um, let's talk a little bit about switching from sub-Q to intravenous. Um, this is something that people sometimes want to do. Um, uh, and again, um, it is something that will take time to start. Um, maybe you want um, to, you're going to have to do the same discussion with your provider and with your insurance company. You're going to have to find a site of care, whether it's going to be at home. Is, it, is your insurance going to cover a nurse to come to your house to do it? Um, are you going to have to go to a hospital or go to a local infusion center? Um, you know, sometimes people do this um, just because it's more convenient for them to, to do it, um, you know, once a month. 
Um, sometimes people do it because they end up having visual problems or, you know, manual dexterity issues. Um, but uh, again, uh, it is something that um, you need to think about and plan with your provider. And um, um, my same um, advice about know thyself um, falls, falls into play here. Um, do you really want to switch from subcutaneous to intravenous? Um, you know, and the scheduling part is important. Where and when do you want to infuse? What's going to be covered? You know, can you get it done at home? Do you have to drive for an hour to uh, a hospital? You know, do you have a way to get to an infusion center? Um, and, you know, what kind of time commitment are you willing to make? Are you willing to get into a place every three to four weeks, depending on how your medication is prescribed, so that you can get your, your intravenous infusion done. Um, again, if you are not able to get in, then um, it's not going to do you any good. Um, um, when you're switching from sub-Q to IV, there are certainly a lot of things that you have to do, no matter, no matter how, what you do and which way you're giving your immunoglobulin, there are a lot of things that you have to do and be prepared for. Um, when you're switching from sub-Q to IV, um, you have to make sure that you've got good IV access. If, you've, you know, if you don't have good veins, you need to think about it. Um, it's probably uh, it's very rare that we would recommend having an infuser port or something like that inserted in somebody with a primary immune deficiency. That just opens you up for too much infection. So you do have to have good veins and IV access. Um, it's a good idea to prehydrate yourself um, before the infusion so that you've got nice full veins, um, and it also helps to mitigate some of the side effects. Um, you may need some pre-medication. Some people um, have a lot of difficulty when um, they're on uh, intravenous and they, get, they may get headaches um, so, um, or they may get um, more intense reactions to the, to the IV route. So some people do need to be medicated ahead of time, sometimes with Benadryl or Tylenol um, or the equivalent of those uh, medications, the diphenhydramine, acetaminophen, um, you know, uh, uh, and sometimes uh, hydrocortisone. Uh, the same thing ha may ha need to be done afterwards. If you're somebody that develops a headache after an infusion, you may need to uh, get medicated after the infusion. Um, and um, you also have to be prepared and um, planning for any kind of emergency that um, could potentially happen um, uh, when you're getting an IV infusion. Um, uh, certainly, the, you know, there are benefits when you switch uh, from sub-Q to intravenous. Um, it's, fewer, it's fewer infusions. Um, you can be completely dependent on somebody else, and you don't have to worry about doing it yourself other than just getting yourself there. Uh, some people really enjoy the social contact of other people in the infusion center. Um, and it does certainly give you the chance to interact with your provider and ask any questions that may be coming up because you're going to be seeing the same people over and over on a regular basis. Um, there are certainly challenges um, that come along with the IV route. Um, there are increased side effects. Um, uh, uh, certainly things like headache, stomach ache, and nausea can occur with all immunoglobulin products. Um, they do occur a little bit more often with intravenous than they do with subcutaneous. And um, allergic and anaphylactic reactions also tend to occur a little bit more often um, with the intravenous route than with the subcutaneous route. Um, certainly if you um, have an infection um, uh, when you're going in to, um, uh, to get your infusion, you do want to notify your provider 
um, because sometimes if you're going in and you're receiving intravenous immunoglobulin and you've got an infection, um, you may be more prone to uh, having a, uh, a, a reaction uh, to the product. Um, so you, um, you, you really do want to communicate with um, your infusion um, center or room staff or whoever it is that's coming to the home to do it. Um, certainly make sure um, when you're getting your IVIG, if you're getting it at home, make sure that it's at room temperature because cold IVIG um, is more prone to produce side effects. It really needs to be there uh, at room temperature before you're going to give it. Um, also, if it's infused too quickly, um, it can produce side effects. So um, if you find that you're getting headaches, uh, you know, or, or nausea, um, sometimes um, stopping the infusion um, and waiting 15 to 30 minutes and then starting it up again at a slower rate will help. Um, and again, um, it's important to be hydrated. And then, it, as I had mentioned um, a little bit before, um, you may need to um, get other medications to go along with it, such as the diphenhydramine, you see in NFN and hydrocortisone. Um, uh, cautions about IVIG. Um, it's important to remember that not all IVIG is the same. The brands are, it's not like, you know, Coke or Pepsi. Um, you know, there, there are significant differences between all of the products. So you need to know which product that you're getting, um, and if you are tolerating that product, stick to it. If you're having a lot of reactions from a particular product, then you need to have that discussion with your provider and get them to um, try a different product with you. Um, but certainly you shouldn't be um, getting one product one week and then another product another week and then back and forth because the products are not all the same. So um, you really have to be very well informed. Um, and I think that it's really important to keep good records, particularly if you're being infused um, at home. Um, you should know the, the, the lot number of your medication, the expiration date. Um, you should know that it's got to be a clear, not cloudy product when you're using it. Um, and record all of the information about the product. And certainly um, the IDF um, has uh, an electronic um, uh, health record um, that um, will be um, Will, will be a, a good place to um, record that information. Um, um, when you are um, dealing and trying to make a decision between which route you're going to use, whether it's going to be IV or subcutaneous, you really need to be informed. Um, look at the pros and cons of both routes look at what fits your particular lifestyle. Um, the choice is really, the choice is ultimately going to be yours um, because as providers, we want to make sure that if you've got a primary immune deficiency and you need to be on immunoglobulin therapy, we want you to use it. Um, if you're not able to use it, if it doesn't fit your lifestyle, if you're gonna be you know, casual or cavalier about it and say, no, I don't have to do it today, um, that it's, it's not going to be helpful. So um, please be informed, um, uh, have a good discussion with your particular provider and make a choice for what really is going to be best and what is going to work for you. Thanks. Thank you for watching this video. And also a big thank you to CSL Bearing for sponsoring this wonderful program. If you have any questions, please email us at idfyoungadult at primaryimmune.org. And be sure to visit primaryimmune.org slash youngadults to see the many resources that we offer young adults with PI.